much. Um, that is a very difficult act to follow. Um, thank you for staying in the room. I'm sorry. I will speak to you in English. I can speak Italian, but only in my dreams. <laughs> I, I apologize for this. I apologize for this personal fault, uh, which is one of many linguistic and otherwise. Um, Thank you for permitting me to speak to you uh, in English. And thanks to the translators, I will try to keep to the text that I have provided and that they have in front of them. In the spring of this year, I was a visiting professor at the University of Padova. This was a wonderful opportunity for me to see, really, for the first time, the breadth and depth of Italian scholarship in my field, which is labor law. And although I had a decade before been a visiting fellow at the European University Institute in Florence uh, and made contact with and worked with Italian scholars such as Bruno Caruso, Silvana Sciara, Lucio Boccaro, Guido Volandi, Adriana Topo, Ricardo del Punto and others, it was this intense period in the spring of this year which really opened up and revealed the Italian intellectual landscape to my eyes. I met many more scholars, received invitations to give talks at a number of other universities, and extended my range of contacts. I became aware of interesting comparative labor law dimensions, of new ideas, of shared concerns, but also of the deep complications of speaking across the common law, civil law divide when it comes to basic jurisprudential issues. Now, I have to say that I also tried to learn more about and understand Italian politics. That remains for me a difficult and ongoing project. But today, I'm learning a great deal more. The invitation to be with you today is a direct and wonderful result of that period in Padova earlier this year. Again, I must thank Professor Adriana Topo for her invitation to Padova, from which so much else has flowed, including the opportunity to be here today. This leads me to thank the organizers of this meeting, this important meeting, for their invitation to take part and to be with you this afternoon. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Professor Bennett Benedetto Ponti for in that regard, and also to thank him for his kind attention to the details of my visit. I also have to thank uh, Professor Giuseppe Ciela Massara for encouraging me to attend. For in his letter of invitation, Professor Ponti asked me to address a topic which has been of great interest to me and many others for a long time. Benedetto asked that I talk about, quote, the impact of globalization on workers and wages safeguards and guarantees, a reflection on the long-term effects of the multi-decade process of globalization at work and on workers, with a focus on those in the first world without neglecting a global reading of the phenomenon. The speech will also be a valuable opportunity for reflection of labor policies in Italy. Now this, to me, is a wonderful invitation for a number of reasons. Let me identify three of them. It is first an opportunity to look back on decades of developments. As I shall discuss, when I first started out as a labor law professor 40 years ago, globalization was not a word, or not a word, at least in common circulation. The revolutions in communications and transportation technologies had yet to unfold. Most workers were employees with long-term contracts of employment. And although we can now see clearly that the post-war compromise of 
what is called embedded liberalism, was then unraveling and coming to an end, this was not as apparent at the time as it has come to be with hindsight. Forty years ago, the rise of neoliberalism was in its very infancy. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were yet to be elected. The Berlin Wall was well in place. China remained in isolation. The European community consisted of nine member states. The financial and euro crisis that followed 30 years in the future. Brexit and Trump, almost 40 years. Stalin once said, quote, there are decades when nothing happens and weeks when decades happen, close quote. We are not talking here of decades where nothing happened. Much has happened. The issue is, what do we make of it? Are we witnessing, as Wolfgang Strieck would have it, the end of capitalism? Or, as Martin Wolf, a well-known defender of globalization and others worry, the end of democracy. What are we to make of populisms of both the left and the right? Can Europe remain a beacon of hope to others, such as Canadians, offering a model or models for those seeking a just and sustainable society? Now, the second reason Professor Ponty's invitation is interesting to me is that it provides an opportunity to reflect not only upon the impact of globalization upon workers, but upon labor law. One way of putting this is to note the following. Labor law's battle cry, certainly at the ILO, the International Labor Organization, but in many other places, has been for a very long time that, quote, labor is not a commodity, close quote. My own view is that this is a mistake. I will talk about this later. And can be summed up as, quote, labor is not not a commodity. It is much more important than that. I will come back to that idea. But one of, if not the defining features of our debates about globalization and labor has not been about the direct impact on jobs and workers, but about the indirect impact upon labor laws and the ability of individual states to maintain labor laws in the face of global economic integration. Much of our discussion over the past 40 years has been about social dumping, regulatory competition, races to the bottom. This meant for defenders of labor law that the battle cry labor is not a commodity, had to be supplemented by a second battle cry, labor law is not a commodity. That is still a contentious, and in my view, often misleading slogan about which we have learned over the past 40 years, quite a lot. Now, my remarks today come in two parts, some initial remarks about the past 40 years, and then an argument about labor law's role in these events an unfortunate role, in my view. My main object today in my initial remarks will be to try to clarify the true nature of our labor law struggles over the past 40 years by relying upon two important interventions which offer ways of framing, at a general level, the state of affairs we have confronted and still confront. First, I will deploy the idea best articulated by my friend Harry Arthurs, the undisputed Dean of Canadian Labor Law, that we can and must see labor law issues as playing out upon the terrain consisting of what he calls, quote, the large tectonic plates of the international economy, close quote. Harry Arthurs has invoked this metaphor of plate tectonics to suggest a necessary broadening of the concerns of labor lawyers. These plates provide the foundations the space for labor law. And he describes them as the powerful forces of political economy that are invisible, or at least unmarked, on conventional maps of labor law. These plates in, implicate many areas of law, tax law, trade law, investment law, immigration law, social welfare law, as well as corporate, 
securities, bankruptcy, and intellectual property law. Then we add demographics. And for the translators, this is not in the paper. This year, for the first time in human history, there are more people on the earth over the age of 30 than under the age of 30. Secondly, climate change. These are large tectonic plates which labor law has barely begun to comprehend. These large features of our political economy are what really drive the concrete day-to-day -day issues of labor law. Unless we pay attention to plate tectonics and lift our eyes from the traditional map drawn at a smaller scale, we will be forever distracted from the real action. Many labor lawyers have long struggled to grasp this point and have kept their noses too close to the labor law workbench. But it is one of the silver linings, one of the blessings of the past 40 years that this method of proceeding is now widely seen as a bad one. The second intervention to which I will also appeal is the elegant, and I am certain familiar to you, formulation articulated by the Harvard economist Danny Roderick that our current version of globalization presents us with what he calls a trilemma. Not a dilemma, but a trilemma. Although this is a much discussed idea, I find it most useful for a specific reason. It reminds us that we face two issues. Our first order problem of what substantive labor policies do we need, but also a second order problem. What is the process by which and space in which we have been and should now be answering that first order question. But I also admire Roderick's formulation for another very simple reason. It seems to me the most elegant, understandable, and general summary of our past 40 years and our present predicament about which many agree. Roderick simply has found a way of elegantly articulating and framing. Now this brings me to the third reason, and perhaps most interesting reason, that Benedetto's invitation attracted me. It is because in the end it directs us back to our world, to the world of domestic, in this case, Italian labor law policy. This is, in my view, a critical and correct final focal point for our discussion. This is because law enters the world, makes contact with it, only within a functioning legal system. And such legal systems are overwhelmingly domestic. A central part of my thinking about such systems is the following. Even if we can solve Roderick's dilemma in a new and better way, even if we realign what Arthur calls the tectonic plates undergirding our current version of hyper-globalization, even if we reconstruct the democratic space in which we might create a better human labor policy, even if all that comes to pass, we will still face what I will call an internal threat. This threat is not one forced upon us by large exogenous forces or plate tectonics. It is one of labor law's own making. It is also one which has been a large part of the problem. Indeed, my argument will be that this internal labor law problem has provided energy for and incentives to the problematic alignment of our tectonic plates. Labor law has pointed the way. One final preliminary remark. Um, there is a very real asymmetry I need to mention. I am not an economist. I'm also not a European. I'm a lawyer and I'm a Canadian. In the first part of these remarks, I will be trespassing upon your territory. I will try to tread lightly but the truth is, as I see it, this act of trespass is necessary in order for me to get to the terrain I do wish to cover, which is how we think about labor law, how that is part of the problem, that is how labor law thinking contributes to the troubled territory which is well within your domain and with which you are so familiar. Now, the preliminary remarks. These are remarks about the structure of the past 40 years. Let me begin with a general observation. One of the advantages of reading the work of the Oxford historian 
Peter Frankopan. You may have noticed his book called The Silk Roads and a follow-on volume called The New Silk Roads. Um, is that he reminds us that globalization is an ancient phenomenon. Further, that some of the immediate goings on in the world as we now find it, such as the rise of China to a position of global superpower, is best seen through a lens drawn back to take a longer view. On that longer view, what we are witnessing is a reversion to an, an historical norm, not an anomaly, but a reversion to a norm. But speaking for myself, and I expect most of us, the centuries in which uh, we have witnessed the rise of the West, the European Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, represent my relevant history, and it is here that most recent accounts of globalization and indeed labor law begin their story. There is now a very well-known and indeed received, that is almost official, account of that history. It begins as follows. We in the West lived in a highly globalized world in the century before World War I, often referred to by economic historians as, quote, the first era of globalization, close quote. This ended in 1914 and was followed by the period which the British historian Eric Hobsbawm labeled the age of catastrophe, the age of catastrophe. This is the period 1914 to 1945. This is the period in which the world witnessed the breakdown of the Western civilization of the 19th century and the destruction of the globalized economy. Two world wars and the Great Depression had a great deal to do with that. The age of a catastrophe was in turn followed by what Hobsbawm labels the post-war golden era, and many people use that phrase. The French use the phrase les, les trente glorieuses. This post-war period of growth and prosperity was, was underwritten by an accommodation between capitalism and democracy. This compromise has been called many things, including most famously perhaps embedded liberalism. Wolfgang Strieck calls it the standard model of democracy. Uh, Lucio Baccaro and Chris Howell in their recent volume call it the quote historical compromise. Now, the standard story continues. This golden era came to an end sometime in the late 1970s when growth rates in the successful economies were cut in half, roughly, and the post-war compromise was torn asunder. It ushered in an era which Hobsbawm calls the landslide. Now, I grew up and completed my education during the golden era. Since then, I have lived my entire life, including my entire life as a labor law professor, in the era Hobsbawm calls the landslide. And for the younger people in this room, the landslide is all they have ever known. We are now nearing 40 years of first trying to see and then come to grips with this story. Hobsbawm's account ends in the last century but his temporal categorization remains salient and I think even dominant. We now have to update it, particularly with an account of the decade of moderate growth just before the financial crisis and the disappointing decade since. But from a labor lawyer's point of view, and I think many others, there is a structure for the entire period, roughly 1980 to the present. This is almost exactly the period in which I have been teaching labor law. That is to say, as I read it as a non-expert, many of our leading scholars of political economy remain of the view that the critical inflection point came at the end of the golden era, sometime in the period 1975 to 1980. But there is no consensus about what or even whether we can do anything about that. On this latter point, Streak, Wolfgang Streak, for example, is extremely pessimistic and believes that capitalism is dying slowly of an overdose of itself. Others hold out hope. The inflection point was a profound one and was followed by an equally profound set of shocks in the post-war settlement in the West. While it is common to speak of the new era, the new dispensation as one of globalization, this has had a series of meetings. 
as initially celebrated by proponents, globalization was understood in terms of free trade. But it gradually became clear that the new reality was far more complex than a world in which freer trade in goods was involved and for which Ricardo's wonderful insight about the idea of comparative advantage provided a compelling rationale. Many missed, initially, the reality and implications of financial globalization. As became clear, the new world order under construction was best understood as one of deep economic integration in which all factors of production, capital, ideas, services, components, information, but not, for the most part, human beings, were mobile. As a result, new producers and consumers came online, and a new geography of production and consumption, as well as finance, made imaginable and exploited. Not only a new ge geography, but the dismantling of old and creation of new types of firms and structures for bringing together factors of production. New communications and transportation technologies facilitated and accelerated this process. China emerged from economic isolation and, when combined with India and Russia, as the Harvard economist Richard Freeman has observed, at one fell swoop doubled the world's workforce. Free trade agreements became more than free trade agreements as they increasingly, at the behest of private interests, went beyond tariff reduction at the border to address internal domestic regulatory issues, either explicitly or implicitly. Trade, foreign direct investment, international capital flow levels increased dramatically. The benefits and large, lar large losses from this new division of labor were large and not equally distributed. Dislocations, especially in manufacturing in the West, were large. It became clear that they were losers as a result of all of this reordering. Other large tectonic plates in the political economy of the West ground, ground their way to new alignments. The shift from tax to borrowing, the impoverishment of government, the financialization of the economy, both public and private, the overall shifts from a high-growth, demand-led inflationary regime to a low-growth, deflationary uh, and secular stagnation economic reality. Changes in the theory of the firm, in some countries at least, the rise of the legally odd idea of the primacy of shareholder value, the empowering of capital markets, the resulting shifts in executive compensation with perverse incentives, the reality of large-scale international tax evasion, the decline in unionization density rates in many places, and of worker voice within firms and in our politics. The disappearance of class as a category and the substitution of other multiple and narrower identities, gender, race, religion, and so on. Stagnation in progressive labor law reform open adoption of the neoliberal agenda by some courts to counter laws even about basic rights and freedoms to the contrary. A hyperactive World Trade Organization legal order which found it difficult to see domestic regulation as anything but illegal protectionism. Abandonment in some places, such as the United States, of any pretext about a neutral rule of law for all including workers, protected by an independent judiciary, and so on. All contributed to our new world. But the inflection point, this new world did not just happen. Nothing just happens. That is a quote again from my friend Harry Arthurs. Globalization is first and foremost a mental event, a change in mindset. It was Harry Arthurs who coined the phrase, quote, globalization of the mind, close quote. In the prior speech, there was reference to, in the prior remarkable speech, there was reference to Margaret Thatcher's idea, quote, there is no alternative, close quote. This is part of what Harry Arthurs is trying to capture with his idea of globalization of the mind. The rise of neoliberal, pro-free trade, anti-welfare state, anti-tax politics and politicians, initially in what now appears as a moderate form in Thatcher and Reagan, 
the rise in market ideology, both domestically and also transmitted internationally via the Washington Consensus, was in large part a mental event. The financial crisis offered us an opportunity, as some of the chief architects of the global economic order, such as Alan Greenspan, detected a flaw in what he called the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works. That was Greenspan's famous and dramatic explanation of what the financial crisis had revealed to him. Now, the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works is, as the British author John Lanchester puts it, quote, a hell of a place to find a flaw, close quote. But that is, as I shall argue below regarding labor law, where the action is. And it seems clear that in the decade post-crisis, the world has still not learned some truly important lessons. We have struggled to come up with a better critical defining structure. So has labor law. Now, uh, some of the basic results of all of this are very well known. From the global perspective, the results are best shown in what is often called the most important graph ever produced by the World Bank. And this is the famous elephant, elephant graph that is shaped like an elephant. That is, it slopes up and then down and then a long trunk goes up. And uh, I, I don't show it on a slide. I'm sure you've seen it too many times already. But the positive story of globalization is shown in that graph. And that is, it's the story of sustained high growth resulting in the historic rising out of absolute poverty in the period 1988 to 2008 of a very large number of our fellow human beings in China and elsewhere in the developing world. In China alone, 800 million people, largely rural dwellers, were lifted out of absolute poverty since the 1980s. Now, back around that era, absolute poverty was defined on living less than a dollar a day. Now, um, since 1912, that is post-crisis, another 80 million Chinese citizens have been lifted out of absolute poverty. John Lanchester recently wrote, quote, there is a strong claim that this scale of growth sustained for an unprecedented number of people over such a number of years is the greatest economic achievement in human history. But the downside is also told in the elephant graph, the decline of fortunes of those in the middle class and also the rise of the 1% and the 0.1% and the 0.01%. The elephant graph shows an incline, a big increase for those in China, lifted out of absolute, then distinct drop for the middle class in Europe and the West, and then an extraordinary rise at the, to at the top end for the 1% and the 0.1%. Now, that graph has been updated by the authors of the World Inequality Report in 2018. The picture looks very similar. Um, the report makes clear that there are nuanced differences among countries grouped together under the heading squeezed bottom 90% in the US and Western Europe. Most of these are due to redistributional policy differences which play an important role in shaping inequality. In particular, the grouping US and Western Europe masks a very large difference in income inequality between the United States and Western Europe. While incomes of the top 10% have risen in all of these countries, they have done so only moderately in Western Europe, but hugely in the United States, largely due to massive educational inequalities combined with a tax system that grew less progressive despite a surge in top compensation. Other results are also well known. The decoupling of real average wages from labor productivity a decline in labor share of national income. Wage growth in the bottom half of the distribution has become decoupled from the top. One final empirical shift to note. Jobs have become polarized in OECD countries. Middle-skilled jobs are disappearing while the share of high jobs grows in all countries and the share of low-skilled jobs grows in almost all countries. The growth in high-skilled jobs dominates. The link to technology and automation is much debated. Now, the 2018 
World Inequality Report makes for much happier reading in Europe than it does in other regions of the world. In fact, the report offers alternative projections of the future of inequality, which the report labels business as usual, that's one possible future, and the alternative is alternative future of following Europe's policy lead, noting if in the coming years all countries follow the moderate inequality trajectory of Europe over the past decades, global income inequality can be reduced. The 2018 report then takes its stand on how to, ju to adjust some of the tectonic plates of our political economy to avoid a business as usual future. Tax prog progressivity, a series of mechanisms controlling tax evasion, especially via international tax havens, improving access to education and good jobs, and overcoming the poverty of even rich country governments overburdened by public debt. This series of policy recommendations can be compared with those recently set out by others, including Joseph Stiglitz, Danny Roderick, Robert Reich, Colin Meyer, Paul Collier, Lucio Vaccaro, and Chris Howell, as well as recent reports from the OECD, the ILO, the World Bank, and the World Economic Forum. There is much overlap in the policy prescriptions from all of those sources. But the point of my remarks is not to join that policy conversation directly and on its own terms, but to make an observation about the role of labor law in creating our problems in the first place, in finding a way out. Now, that's the point I want to get to, the role of labor law in all of this. But before mentioning that, let me just remind you of Danny Roderick's idea of the trilemma. Now, to my mind, of all the important thinkers who have tried to shed a general and bright light upon all of this, it is, in my view, Danny Roderick who has had uh, provided the most illumination and in a very accessible manner. Roderick's well-known and very important idea is that we cannot have all three of hyper-globalization, national sovereignty, and democratic politics. Of those three, we must choose two. We can only have two at a time, and we need to choose which two we prefer. On Roderick's analysis, in the post-war era, in the golden era, we chose and created a world of national sovereignty and democratic politics, but not hyper-globalization. We did so by constraining globalization through the Bretton Woods Compromise. This made available a democratic space in which the possibility of a set of locally variable domestic policy options linking productivity growth to increased demand were made available to us and democratically chosen. For an account of the Italian version of that story, I refer, to, for, I refer, to, refer you to chapter seven of Lucio Baccaro's and Chris Howell's book entitled Trajectories of Neoliberal Transformation. In Roderick's terms, it is clear that the choice we have made in the post-Golden War era in the landslide is hyper-globalization in a world still consisting of nation states. That leads to an erosion of democracy. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with this idea and, and uh, Danny Roderick's work, but if not, this is a very simple way of capturing a very complex story. Um, for many people, uh, Roderick included, the third option, what we should have is democracy and hyper-globalization, but not the nation state. That's the third possible choice of two out of the three. Remains a pipe dream. It is just not a possible idea in the world as we now find it. The idea of global democracy to match up with the global economy is just not politically imaginable. This is the reason it's not a serious possible answer. For other thinkers, it's not just a matter of pragmatics. Many important thinkers uh, believe that it is a matter of deep normative significance that we retain an, appro an appropriate attachment to the notion of the nation state. I'm thinking here of important thinkers such as Martha Nussbaum. Then there is the empirical fact that nationalisms of both the left and the right have great popular support. 
hence the common use of the phrase national populist. We can also note the rarity of the use of the phrase international populism. Then there is the legal point that we need a legal system and these are overwhelmingly national. So I think for all these reasons, Roderick is right. Our real choices are only two and the real choice which he is advocating for is a return to the post-war compromise where we have democratic politics, the national state, and a version of international economic cooperation, which is not the version we have now. That is to say, we do away with hyper-globalization. Now, the institutional arrangements put in place, neoliberal hyper-globalization following the demise of the post-war consensus, are no longer politically palatable for many and evidently so for many citizens in the developed world. But the skepticism animating the nationalist and populist revival is one of a pervasive and deep variety. While it is clear that the current arrangements are unsatisfactory, the ways in which they are seen to be lacking are potentially destabilizing for any reform. That is, the political space for the sort of reform agenda required to legally structure such a new compromise as contemplated by Roderick, Stiglitz, Piketty, and others is at the very least hard to find in the world in which we now live. And when we do find that space, it is often used for domestic and most often regressive political ends, ends contrary to the interests that precipitated current events. But put all of that aside, put all of the current difficulties aside, put all of the history aside, and imagine the following. Imagine that we have the meaningful nation-state-based domestic and international spaces in which to ask our important questions. What kind of world do we wish to live in? What sort of labor law do we need as part of that world? Here is my main point. We will never answer those questions well until we identify and act upon a threat which will remain in our new and desirable democratic space. That threat is an internal threat one of labor law's own making. Not specific labor laws, but how we think about labor law. That is the threat. As with globalization of the mind, the internal threat lies where most important issues are to be found in the human mind. Now, the internal threat comes from a way of thinking about labor law and answering the following questions. First, what is the subject matter of labor law? What part of the world is its concern? Second, what is it for? Why do we have it? What justifies it? And third, what are the basic legal categories and concepts we need to express these ideas in something which looks like law? Now our problem is not that we do not have answers to those questions. Our problem is that we do. Taken together, these answers provide what I call a constituting narrative for labor law. This narrative, narrative is labor law's basic framework of thought it tells us what labor law is and why. That is the internal threat, our current understanding, our current narrative. Now, very, very quickly in the time available, labor law's dominant story is, its constituting narrative is, roughly and quickly, the following. Labor law is about the legal regulation, which we see as contractual relations, between employers and employees, in the name of decent standards for employees, which would not otherwise be obtained because of the power imbalance between the parties to the contract. Both substantive labor law, labor standards such as maximum hours, and procedural labor law, collective bargaining laws, are as a result brought to bear on the contracting process in the efforts to secure justice, or as the ILO now puts it, decency. On this view, labor law is a tax on labor market activity imposed in the name of decency. This leads to international talk tax competition that in turn defines the role of international labor law, the ILO. Its role is to halt that tax competition by way of binding universal minimum, minimum rules, a Geneva consensus uh, to stand up to the Washington consensus, thus preventing a race to the bottom. All of this, in my view, is misconceived, but it is the case, as Wittgenstein noted, this picture holds us captive. 
Here is the fundamental problem with the standard account, and here is how it drives or incentivizes hyperglobalization. Because the account is one which centers on the legal constructs of employer, employee, contracts of employment, collective agreements, and is animated by a desire to correct a power imbalance in those contracts, labor law both stunts itself and also helps create the legal space, the economic incentives for many of the new forms of labor deployment underlying hyperglobalization. Labor law, our conception of labor law, has become a machine for its own undermining. Labor law stunts itself by focusing upon those with a contract. Those in the informal economy are left out. So to all forms of non-contractual, non-paid work. That is a very real problem. But equally important, outside of the informal, non-contract sector, labor law incentivizes, I don't like that word, but it's a very popular word, incentivizes hyperglobalization and thus its own demise by insisting upon contractual linkages and thus opening the door to all manner of what might be called, and here I offer my apologies to the translators, decontractualization as a method of labor law avoidance. These include franchising, outsourcing, once again my apologies to the translators, independent contractorization of employees, that is calling employees independent contractors when they are not, vertical disintegration, network and chain creation, and so on. Some of this is a sham, disguised employment of the old-fashioned kind. Some of it is real and rational, rational given our standard model of labor law. The idea is not that these new structures of production may not have valid economic rationales. Rather, that one large, current, and undesirable rationale is one which labor law, our current conception of labor law, makes available and which should be removed. This is labor law avoidance. In his book, the American David Weil, the book is called The Fissured Workplace, accurately states that a large part of our current problem is that labor law focuses upon, quote, the wrong parties, close quote. This is the case. But the point here is that it is our model of labor law which makes this mistake possible and incentivizes its exploitation. Labor law avoidance via decontractualization is only available on a contractualized account of labor law. Now, an alternative non-contractualized account of labor law is required for many reasons, but an important one is avoiding all of this. In developing such an account, Amartya Sen proves to be an invaluable resource to labor lawyers. Exploring this connection, what I have called using some of Amartya Sen's language, quote, the capability approach to labor law. And if you're interested in that idea, there is a new volume of essays just published a few months ago by Oxford University Press called the capability approach to labor law. You could have reference to that. Now, as many of you will well know, Sen's basic idea is that our true end is not productivity growth, nor a bigger labor code for its own sake, but what he calls human freedom. And by that, he means the real freedom, the real world, positive, substantive capability, not formal freedom, the opposite of formal freedom, the real world, substantive capability to lead long, healthy, meaningful lives that we have reason to value. That's the point of development. And translators, I'm departing here. Uh, it's not increasing in GDP growth per capita, right? It is rather focusing upon the impact of, on the lives of real human beings. And the question is, have we removed obstacles to real substantive human freedom? That's what we should be focusing upon. Now, back to the text. Work, productive activity, is an important dimension of life, both as an end in itself and as a means to other elements of human flourishing. Work can either be corrosive or fertile for human freedom, again, intrinsically and instrumentally. There is an intimate link between what economists call human capital and what Sen calls human freedom slash capability. Human capital must be fostered and created. Education, especially early childhood education, is absolutely critical. It is key. 
But human capital must not only be created, it must be deployed. Now, here is a non-contractualized understanding of labor law in one or two sentences. The law which regulates the deployment of human capital in the name of human freedom and human capability is labor law. Its object is to remove obstacles and create pathways to the deployment of human capital as a vital dimension of human freedom, both as an end in itself, as an important means to other freedoms and capabilities. This is a sense in which I mean what I said earlier. Labor is not, not a commodity. It is much more important than that. It's an important dimension of human freedom and human capability. Now, a basic idea which Sen insists we pay attention to Sen's thinking is quite remarkable for those of you who have not read any of the work of Amartya Sen. I refer, refer you to what is now a 20-year-old book called Development as Freedom. Development as Freedom. It's one of the most remarkable books I've read in my life as an academic. If you've not looked at it, it's a very accessible, very moving, very powerful account of some very basic ideas. One of which is the idea that most of our problems come from failing to distinguish our true ends from our means to achieving those ends. This is a particularly acute problem for labor law. Now, here's a wonderful passage from Sen going back to Immanuel Kant's idea. Immanuel Kant argues for the necessity of seeing human beings as ends in themselves rather than means to other ends. This principle has importance in many contexts, even in, in, in analyzing poverty, progress, and planning. Human beings are the agents, beneficiaries, and adjudicators of progress, but they also happen to be, directly or indirectly, the primary means of all production. This dual role of human beings provides a rich ground for confusion of ends and means in planning and policy making. Indeed, it can and frequently does take the form of focusing on production and prosperity as the essence of progress, treating people as the means through which that productive progress is brought about, rather than seeing the lives of people as the ultimate concern and treating production and prosperity merely as a means to those lives. Now, this problem is, Sen goes on to say, is particularly acute in development theory. My point, and here I'm jumping ahead to the next paragraph, is that it's particularly acute for labor law as well. Labor law's basic mistake has been to confuse means and ends. We have focused upon one means of our true ends, regulating unfair contracts. Contract has then become the limits of our labor law world. This in turn, in turn makes available the strategy of what I have called decontractualization. Labor law thus creates the space for its own undermining, opening the space, pointing in the direction in which the tectonic plates can move and pushing self-interested parties to mobilize to do so. A simple example often helps. We could start, and probably we should start, with the example of an international commodity chain or international production chain. But let me start with a much shorter chain, the idea of a franchise. A franchise is, from this point of view, just a very short chain. It is a chain with two links. It goes from the franchisor to the franchisee to the employees. The model rests and gets much of its incentive in real world circumstances from decontractualization. That is the separation of the franchisor from the people actually doing the work. This is, from the franchisor's view, a large part of the economic arrangement. Now, but this move of decontractualization is only available on an odd idea about how labor law issues work. The problem is that happens to be our dominant and current idea. But there is hope. There are those in the legal world who see the problem with the current uh, story that labor law tells itself. Here is a Canadian example, a word of explanation. Tim Hortons is a very peculiar Canadian institution. It's a national chain of coffee shops named after a very important hockey player 
who played in Toronto a long time ago. It's a very Canadian institution. In every small town and village in Canada, you will find one of these real working class, not Starbucks uh, coffee shops. Now, uh, there was a case that arose in British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. It's a very small case, but it holds great potential. In that case, the Steelworkers Union um, filed a human rights complaint on behalf of a group of immigrant workers from the Philippines. The workers alleged a pattern of discrimination, including the refusal to pay overtime premiums, giving them less desirable shifts than other workers, and threatening workers with being sent back to the Philippines. The complaint was filed against both the local owners of the franchise, but also against the national firm Tin Hortons. So not only against the franchisee who directly hired the workers, but against the franchisor. Now, of course, the franchisor, Tim Hortons, relying upon labor law's standard narrative, objected that these workers were not its employees, that it was not a party to a contract of employment, nor a contract of any sort with these workers, that it was not their employer, and thus had nothing to do with the matter. It's very similar, and here I'm departing from the text, to the initial reaction of Nike when presented with evidence of gross unfair labor practices in its manufacturing plants in China and elsewhere in the developing world. Those are not our people. We have nothing to do with them. We don't have a contract with them. Our contract is with somebody else. We are not responsible. Now, amazingly, the little human rights tribunal in British Columbia rejected uh, the standard argument. Now, lurking here are some important ideas which we do not have to worry about. What we can see in the tribunal's rejection of the employer's orthodox defense is the working out of a new way of thinking about labor law, a new picture, one that is rational, purposive in its thinking, and deeply pragmatic about how best to pursue those purposes. Once we see the purpose of the labor law in question, the elimination of discrimination at work, and we can put that in the larger capability framework of Amartya Sen, we can then ask a pragmatic question. How best can we achieve that end? Who is in a position to prevent the problem in the first place and remedy it if it does occur? This is the best way to answer the question, if we still wish to ask it, who is the employer for the purposes of labor law? The old nonsense about the employer being the person who has a contract of a certain sort under which they control or subordinate another person, the employee, is displaced by a much better question of who controls the achievement of the purposes of the law. So our question moves from not who controls another person, that's who the employer is, not who controls another person, but who controls the achievement of our purpose. Now this is quite a good idea in my view, but it is a hard one. Um, Nietzsche once said, the most common form of stupidity is forgetting what it is you are trying to do. The most common form of stupidity is forgetting what it is you are trying to do. That is, it's very hard to shake old patterns of thought. It's very hard to think clearly about what our purposes are and to keep those constantly in mind, to keep our true ends in sight. But uh, my view is it's not only a good idea, it's quite a radical idea because if we took those ideas seriously, it involves a total departure from labor law's old narrative. It requires and rests upon a revolution in our thinking, a new picture. We can then take that approach and apply that to global commodity chains or value chains. We can run this picture across borders. Uh, we can encounter the whole of the modern labor law world. I do not do that today. The main point today is that our first problem, our first hurdle, which we must get over, is the internal one of labor law's self-understanding. It is a formidable obstacle. We have far too decisions like the one in Tim Hortons. There is some indication that the world may be beginning, may be beginning to wake up to these truths. For example, the World Bank in its 2019 World Development Report entitled The Changing Nature of Work states, adjusting to the changing nature of work requires rethinking the social contract 
We need new ways to invest in people and to protect them regardless of their employment status. The report is cl clearly focused upon the primacy of human capital. And at the ILO, a similar but yet very undeveloped idea is emerging of a, quote, human-centered agenda. I believe this is the best way to understand what have I just outlined, breaking out of the contractual picture and into a human-centered uh, agenda. Uh, taking these ideas seriously is, for me, the most important dimension of labor law form, reform. Now, if you in Italy were engaged in labor law reform, um, as we are in Canada and most other parts of the world, and worrying about what sort of labor law we need going forward, this is all assuming that we've solved Danny Roderick's trilemma. We have created the national democratic space in which to have a serious debate about good labor law policy. And if we could get over this internal labor law problem, get out of the old box that labor law put itself in, what would a labor law reform project look like? Well, I think first it involves seeing that the contract of employment is merely one platform for delivering labor law, one that melded with, made sense in a certain economic era, at a certain point in economic history. But it's only one. We need at least two others. One is what I would call career, and the other is basic citizenship. Uh, now, this idea of platforms is basic, and what I'm suggesting is we need to break out of the dominant contractual platform and see the availability of these other higher level platforms, career and citizenship. And then a project of labor law reform would take the following shape. We would start by reminding ourselves that the purpose of labor law, what labor law is, it is the law which regulates the deployment of human capital in the name of human freedom and human capability. That is labor law. Its object is to remove obstacles and create pathways to the deployment of human capital as a vital dimension of human freedom, both as an end in itself and as an, import and as an important means to other freedoms and capabilities. Two, to identify the purposes of the labor laws we have or should have, health and safety, human rights, rights to associate, and so on. We should see all of those as efforts to remove obstacles and create pathways to the deployment of human capital understood as part of substantive human freedom and capability. To make work fertile for and not corrosive of human freedom. Third, to map the new world of production, platforms, gig economy, outsourcing, commodity chains, whatever. Fourth, then think pragmatically. How do we achieve this particular labor law purpose say the purpose in the Tim Hortons case, removal of discrimination from the workplace. What platform is best suited to that purpose in the world as we find it? Contract, career, citizenship. It makes no sense, for example, to tie pensions to individual employers in many of the circumstances that characterize the modern world of production. We need to tie that to either citizenship or career. Finally, when considering the contract platform to follow the lead of Tim Hortons and ask pragmatically, who is best placed to deliver on our purpose? Prevent violations in the first place, remedy them when they do occur, respond to incentives, internalize costs, and so on. This is, the, that is, focus on the right party. Now, all of that, if, if we were to take that seriously as a matrix for labor law reform, is just mapping out a huge project an awful lot of detail must follow. But that detail has, as I say, to be local. And I have no expertise in Italian labor law. I wouldn't presume to suggest how this complex matrix would be filled in across all the issues of labor law, across all of the available platforms, measured against all other ways in which work is being done being done today. I leave that to you. Of course, all of this assumes that Wolfgang Streeck is wrong, that it is not too late, 
I assume that at least some of you are here today in the belief that he is wrong, and that's why I'm here as well. Thanks very much.